You are welcome back to Hello Nigeria, and it's time for us to have our special guest is seated right here in the studio. He's one of Nollywood's most recognizable faces. He's starred in over 150 movies and is one of the highest paid in the country. He needs no introduction. His name is Jim Ike. Hi. Nice to have you on Hello Nigeria. Thanks Thank for joining you for joining us. us. Thank you. Hello. Appreciate Great it. to have you on the show. Thank you, guys. You know, you. I didn't know you were born in Libreville. Gabon. Yes, well, sure. quite interesting. Yeah. Well, Can you tell us about your, what are your earliest childhood memories? Um, I grew up predominantly around women. Mm. I had uh, as many as eight to nine women in the house oh, wow. all the time. I was the only guy. Um, I have six sisters, my mom, mm. um, my aunt, and my cousin that, that constituted the family. So um, growing up was, um, you know, around the table, was the chief um, discussions were around fashion, you know bags and shoes and all whatnot. So I, I found my escaping books, uh, and watching TV, you know, imaginary friends. I, I was a very shy kid, excruciatingly shy, actually. And um, so I, I had to create my Who would own have world. thought? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, I think that's um, one of the reasons my parents really kicked against it when I wanted to be an actor. They were like, you can't even come downstairs to meet family, <laughs> let alone you know, facing the camera, but um, that, that's what life was about. But it was a close-knit family. My mom was um, more like the dad, and my dad was a cool parent. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we had a great time going on. So she was a disciplinarian. She was. I'm glad you talk days. about your mom so often, even when you talk about your childhood. Mm -hmm. Now, today on the show is Human Angle Thursday, and mm -hmm. we love to look at, you know, bring out the humanity in every human being, as I'm sure everyone has. Now, we know that it was very public when your mom unfortunately passed away and we know that you talked about it a little in interviews about how it affected you. Could you talk about how, you know, what it meant to you and how you dealt with it? Um, as, um, as again, opening um, wounds that hopefully <laughs> I, was on the, uh, I was on the healing path. Um, my mom was um, um, very profound in our lives. We're a very close-knit family. Um, she had certain principles that I think is very unorthodox in parenting. Um, she would make you face your fears headlong. People think I'm fearless. I've done some crazy things. Yeah, like, maybe because of the roles you <laughs> play. Uh, well, I love yeah. primarily the roles. My approach to life, um, I do sequences, the way I, I, I see a perspective in things, the way I, I like to completely go against the grain you know, fearlessly. Uh, I think she, she, she imbibed that in me the ability to look at things from a different point of view. She's always been that kind of person. She, she was very aggressive when she chases her goals, um, always happy, and I took that. You know, she, she, my dad was a very quiet person. I think um, both, both them qualities leave in me. I, I can be terribly quiet to the point of being <laughs> maybe a little rude, mm -hmm. um, and then I can be just outgoing in, in the boss of a moment. Just like that. So um, memory is everything. Um, the memories my mom created while she was alive was very profound. And the legacy she left for us, the kids, to emulate and pass on to our next generation was, was very profound as well. And, and um, I miss every second of my life, really. Mm -hmm. So um, people see you. People watch you on TV. They mm -hmm. know you as Jim Ike. They see you strong, fearless, like because of the roles you play as well. You play yes, very strong and fearless roles. Yes, At the point when you learned your mom had passed, how are you able to deal with it? There are different people who deal with grief mm -hmm. in different ways. Mm -hmm. How are you able to deal with yours? Um, my dad, I've been with my mom for quite a long time. Um, um, I have three sisters before me. They've been together for about 42 years. So he was literally falling apart. Um, my sisters, three were ready to be married in the space of the year. They were falling apart as well. So I had to be the strong one. Mm -hmm. I had to... You know, coming joking. Um, I was in London when the news of her death came, and for 72 hours they couldn't tell me because ours was a like as again with Reid. It was a very uncommon relationship. Um, my mom wasn't my mother; she was my best friend. We we go <laughs> we go camping together. We she lived in Manchester up until our last our last days. Um, we traveled together. My dad was always kind of jealous of our relationship. <laughs> the sisters were even more yeah. jealous of, you know, but because I'll buy her crazy things and she'd go back selling them off or giving them to my sisters. And um, she understood me in depthly. 
She understands what drives me, why I'm relentless. And I, I couldn't deal with it at first, um, so I shut down so that the others could survive. Uh, I thought that was my place, that's what she wanted me to do. That's all, I think, in a sense, she trained me for all my life. Um, every time I came back with something that bothered me or any, any spate of weakness in my life, she would make me face it headlong until I surmounted it and bettered it. And um, when it came to her passing, it was no different in circumstance because I had to you know, let everybody survive first. I had to tell my sisters every day, drumming to them what um, she imbibed in us. And after a while, everybody seemed to get along and, and survive and move on with their life. You know, a kid came in. I should have wanted. Life. I should have wanted. And um, the reverse became my situation. I couldn't deal with stuff mm -hmm. after a while. I think it's, it's called delayed grief, you know, yes. you know something like that. Mm -hmm. And I literally shut down socially, mentally, psychologically. I only knew work. I, I found gentlemen in business that I wanted to mentor me and uh, I in black and white told them that every work that involved traveling, I was ready to do it. I had assistants, of course, that were ready to do it for me, but I wanted to be physically involved in the process and just shut down, you know, mentally, not to deal keep with, with all that. Yeah, keep myself constantly busy. So for two years, it was traveling, working, and, and funny, I made a great deal of money that time. <laughs> but I really didn't know what to do with it. I, I would wake up and do something crazy um, but that, I, I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with life. I, I, I think I, I went through two relationships. One of them was quite famous, um, yeah. this Ghanaian situation. But um, you can't ask for what you can give. You know, I didn't have anything to give to anyone emotionally that time. And um, just when I thought, okay, this might be you know, how I have to find a way to survive and, and possibly accept it, um, my son came. You know, so they say two things will irrevocably change you, um, perhaps a death and a life. And both happened to me in a very short space of time. So when he came, I, I sat down and I said, here is a human being from me that was completely dependent on me. You see that I keep on this path of self-destruction because it was self-destruction. Yeah. And, you know, creatively, I was open, agile, I'm very proficient. But personally inside, inside. I, knew I was dying every day. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to leave for him. I had to. Um, there was no mom, you know, Mugo, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the nursing process. Yeah. Uh, there was no mom to do it. My sisters wanted to fly down to Atlanta to take care of my son, and I refused. Um, we hired a nanny, I fired in 10 days. And um, my ex girlfriend and I, she, she, was, she was just tired. She was, she was ex, ex, exasperated with, with all the crazy, spontaneous decisions I was taking. But I wanted to be there. I wanted to be hands on with him. I felt that process would heal me. I felt that process was what I needed a complete and utter sacrifice mm -hmm. for someone that I loved, um, you know, with, a, with a singular kind of love, would be what perhaps my healing process would come from. And that's what happened. Um, I had to Google, I had to change diapers. Mm -hmm. I had to, Google was my best friend. <laughs> you know, I, I had to learn how to bait him. I had to take him for walks. I understood his mood swings. When he wanted something, he got to a point, I mean, his mom couldn't deal with it because he only needed her for nursing. Yeah. Every other function was, was completely on me. You know, I would, I would, I would, um, I would buy crazy stuff put them together at home, you know, like how to put the best, get out to put the toys. Um, I learned lullabies, I had to Google lullabies. Mm -hmm. I yeah. honestly feel Ooh, like girl. giving you like that. It's so yeah. beautiful to hear. Yeah. And, and yeah. also more important because, um, like I mentioned earlier, you're a public figure and yes. people don't understand the private pains that you go through and private pains you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. At this point, when you were learning how to deal with the death of your mother mm -hmm. and how to adjust to the birth of your son, I'm sure there were times when you were on the road and people wanted to take selfies with you. Mm -hmm. You still had to be the G-Mike that people yes, knew. How, how were you able to deal with it at that point when a random fan comes up to you and says, I want to take a selfie, but you know you're not in the mood for that? Uh, memory is um, everything in our lives. I think without memories, our life will be, you know, will, will be void of context, you know. Um, it will just be carrying on to be transient in every sense. Um, sadly, um, sad memories in our lives um, take precedence over happy ones. Um, I think that's why every being on earth 
should forget your lifelong pursuits to be, you know, goals and very mundane, you know, transitional goals like money making and trying to impress people. I think your chief focus is to impact lives and make, you know, live as happily as you can um, all through your days on earth. Uh, Gladys was that kind of person. I, sorry, I call her Gladys. I, 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 at some point, I, I think it started when I was about 20. I stopped calling her. I call her Gladys. Mm -hmm. They call me Gladys boy. Mm -hmm. uh, I call her Gladys. And, you know, so um, basically, I, um, my mom was very particular. It was imperative for her to live a happy life. You know, I mean, which kind of woman wakes up mm -hmm. in her early 60s and decides I'm moving to Manchester? I said, why? She said she wants to start a daycare center because she did a short spell of a mogul for my, for my, for my um, sister and liked it and mm. thought, I think I can do this. This is what I've always wanted to do. She said, I, I want you to fund it. I said, I'm only listening. Now I'm investing in it. She said, listen, I, have I ever asked you for anything, any business? I want you to fund it. My mom doesn't ask your actual orders. So <laughs> I, I, I went there and I funded it. And it became like almost the last days of her life was... It's because I think she gave her all to raising us, the kids. And as much as she was a businesswoman, she really never found something of personal interest mm. that she wanted to do. So when I saw how happy that made her, I, I was happy. And when money started coming out of it, it even better. <laughs> now, you've mentioned, uh, you've talked about changing lives and transforming lives. Yeah, and, uh, of course, uh, we know the impact your mom had on you mm -hmm. and how she lived her life deliberately mm -hmm. to be happy. You're working on certain, you're working on a new project now called The Adventurers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the end goal is to make people find happiness and fulfillment in their purpose. Can you share some more light on that? Okay. Um... The Adventurer is a show that was, I uh, think, born out of the present circumstances, especially in our polity. Um, there's so many disgruntled um, people, people that uh, I mean, terribly unhappy. Um, it just so happens that um, the the most important demographic in the country, that is, the, between the ages of 18 to 35, that constitutes 60 percent of our GDP, are the unhappiest. You know, and the leaders pretty much sums up the fact that they don't care. Right? They, they lack emotional intelligence, truthfully. And we created this show to address that, to give them a voice of, of sorts. Imagine I draw somebody that's um, all his life, he's learned that Arabic and a certain religion is the light and truth of his life, and he's, he sees life in the, in the one direction of purpose. And I pick that against perhaps um, someone from Onicha, for instance, that has been raised to think that money is everything in his life. As, as long as he has money, his life is full and complete. I, I take somebody from Calibur, for instance, that does not feel he's been given enough opportunities as the man in the north that is, econ is economically more empowered than him. And, and, you know, another totally obscure random person from somewhere else, and I put them in... A location of their dream. You know, I'm talking about Marrakesh, I'm talking about Dubai, Cape Town, Sydney, oh, wow. Paris. So it's not even localized it's in Nigeria? It's not localized at all. Wow. We're leaving for Cape Town on Sunday um, to prepare. Oh, the selection process has been yes, done? Yes, it, it, it's, um, it's not yet done. Oh, okay. How it's done is with 1,000 Naira, you buy our card, there'll be various vendors and different places we're going to place them um, for accessibility. You buy our card or you go online at www.theadventurer.tv and play. There are, we, we have one or two questions you, can, you have to answer. We have to make sure at least you know, yeah. your interest is there and, and then you're, you're capable somewhat. You know. And when you answer the question, that makes you eligible to play. Uh, we're expecting about 1 million people to play. We already have over 150,000 that have played. Our target is 1 million. Uh, we narrow it down to 200,000 to 100,000 to um, consequently, 50, and then the final selection of 16, eight men, eight women. With them, we travel abroad. Um, we're in league, we're in partnership already with most of the um, tourist board of these countries. The support of what we're doing, we're allowed to shoot from the plane to on ground. Um, we'll put you down, put you through different areas of test and challenges that will task you mentally, physically, emotionally, and force you to have a conversation from people from other backgrounds 
and then you begin to see a perspective different from that Sounds which you exciting. were battling. Very exciting. And it's very good television. Too. Absolutely. And so <laughs> it, it changes the narrative in a sense. And then from, from your family to your community to the larger um, um, public, which is um, the country, I think is the kind of conversation we should be forcing our demographics within that age strata to have. So that things will change. Yeah, a 31-year-old is going to be chancellor in uh, Austria very there, soon. There you go. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in Belgium. It, yeah. It's barely 40. Um, Saudi France. Arabia, traditional establishment like that, just made a man that's less than 40 king. Mm. So, I mean, it, this goes on. It's, it's a time to t say categorically that their time is done, respectfully. You need to find a door and let uh, <laughs> fresh air come in. All right, now I have um, two questions for you with regards to your project. Well, yes, you know, um, directed to you. Number one is, I mean, talk about the fact that some people see money as such a big deal. Yes, Perhaps people who haven't really been exposed to money. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the adventurer would do would, to, would be to expose them to that kind of luxury lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, what does money mean to you? You know, what do you, were you exposed at an early age? Were you born without, with a silver spoon? And when you start making a lot of money, what did it do to you? And of course, do you any plans for you to go into politics in the nearest future? Yeah, I'll answer the last and go to the first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Director General of YDP. It's a new, um, a new um, um, party. Um, we created it um, a year or so before I moved to Atlanta. Um, the whole idea was for something as excitable as this, when new frontiers, new horizon can be fostered and people can begin to see a different narrative from the status quo. And that's what we created it for. And if you're over 40, you cannot come on our platform. And we, I'm sure for those that follow me, um, basically that's where I give an insight of my everyday dealings. I've met probably the most powerful men in this continent. I've sat down with them across the I remember the you and Yaya Jame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jame, <laughs> um, Basanjol, mm -hmm. uh, um, Atiku, I've met everybody one-on-one. -on -one. They sit me down to say, your, your ideas are very profound and it's a revolutionary at, at the least. Where do you think you want to go with this? It's not to support, and I think a lot of people misconstrue that. The idea is to force a conversation of a different kind. Now, having said that, um, the, the whole idea of, um, of something like this is to go back to a life that I live, or what that I stand for, basically. Um, money, at some point in my life, meant everything. I woke up for it, I live for it, I would die for it. You know, but again, uh, it, it changes. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I'm getting older, or but perhaps I'm just getting wiser. Oh, you've seen it all. I've yes. seen it all. I've, I've lived a full circle there. There are days I feel I'm 15, and I leave it, I dress it. I, I, I don't care. I'm, I'm profoundly fixated on being happy. And there are days I feel like a 70-year-old man because I have lived that life as well. So um, money, it, it transcends the value of money for me. I think it's about legacy. It's about being innately happy in words because you can't give um, what you don't have. I've seen miserable billionaires, a lot of them around me. I do business with them every day. I have various platforms. There's a man I met recently that came to, I own um, a small estate with some partners, and this man walked up to us and said uh, <clears throat> he wanted half of it. We asked him what for. Um, he didn't explain. He just said, listen, I thought primarily you're here to make money. I just want half of it. Uh, we said, okay, we told him what to take to get involved, to own half. He did. We got what we wanted. As a matter of fact, thankfully, that's what gave us the cash out to start another project. But every now and then, he calls me to do pretty odd things. Um, I'm respectfully saying this, and I will not mention his name. Um, and he did give me permission to talk about it on any platform I have to tell people that money isn't everything. He would show up at my home in Atlanta and we'll go on shopping sprees to a proportion that was... Truthfully annoying. And um, one day he calls me and says that I'm a 65 year old man. I've been married eight times, truthfully, eight times. I have kids that don't speak to me. They don't even understand how crazily wealthy I am. But the truth is that I've lived a life in pursuit of one singular goal all my life. I've educated myself for it, I've made the right contact for it, I've sacrificed relationships that would have bettered my life in values that's different from money for it. And at the end of the day, I got it in my late 50s. Until date, it hasn't changed anything. So money is a good down payment for happiness. Don't get it twisted. You need money to be happy. Exactly. I mean, how are you going to give your people, your um, the ones you love, a good, excitable life? But teach them how to find value in other things. And I think the rest of my life, I've been blessed to meet men like that, so I understand that. 
I want value in many other things that I do apart from what money gives me. I like that you Very really well shared this story with us because mm. at the end of the day, we've come to realize that success can actually make a person mm. or break them. Some people mm. do not know how to handle success. Yeah. All right, so now let's take a look at your... This is not the first time that you're starting a reality TV show. You yes, did one before. People loved it, but for some reason, the reality show didn't continue. And now you're doing another one. So what are the lessons that you learned from your first reality show that we applied to making this one work? And I'm asking this because there are certain Certain young people who have started certain businesses at one point in their lives or the other, but because they felt like it didn't work out as much, they just gave up and didn't continue. So what were the lessons that you learned and how do you get your drive to still keep doing what you do? Oh, passion. Passion is everything. Um, um, you guys ask really remarkable questions. I have to give you that every Thank one you of you. Much. Thank you so much. Um, um, it is refreshing to have good questions thrown at you mm -hmm. and get you to actually think. Um, I, um, I like, if you're not passion driven in things you do, you lose interest at some point. What wakes you up in the morning or what captures your interest? And that's what you must keep alive in your mental archives. Happy moment. Relieve it constantly and play like a record till it breaks. You know, redo it, fix it, keep playing it. I'm constantly happy. I don't know how to be unhappy, really. I, I, I've drummed it so much in myself, I cannot entertain any shadow or degree of, of negativism around me. I, it just won't work. Even when you throw it at me, I'll get mad, get over it, and continue being happy. That's the only way I know. So I think if you're happy and you're passionate about what, you, what drives you, you know, it, everything consequently come together. And that's how I, I approach businesses. What people don't know that I've invested in over 15 platforms. Truthfully, I counted, as I yesterday, I was relieving certain memories of my sister, 15 platforms. Nine of them failed. And every time it fails, I go home, cry, get over it. There's a, there's a time I lost so much money, I was depressed for five days. Seriously, I shot myself in a hotel in America and, and just, you know, licked my... I don't know how to share my grief with people. I really don't because nobody will understand and they will call you out in a way that is not necessary. So I've learned to hold things down by yourself. The world won't break apart. And I think the biggest exercise I've always, I've always been through in my life, I've always you know, uh, allowed to be a part of my life is, is, is prayers. I've prayed myself out of more situations than I can even begin mm -hmm. to monster. You know, there's actually, I feel like there's so much inside of you that mm. we need to extract. There's too many questions yeah. still going through mm. my mind, but yeah. we're really run out of time. Yeah. But thank you so much thank you. for joining yeah. us and here. It's been a pleasure. I wish you all the best with thank your you. latest Appreciate project, the adventure. the adventure. The Adventurer.tv, yes. if people would like to play. Yeah. And it's still open for it's those who are open. interested. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Mm. Thank you. All right, um, today in history, we had Jim Mike on our set for okay. the very first time in Hello, Nigeria. And we hope that we can have him again because there's still so much we need to ask. Yeah. To enjoy more of these our Ogunge videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.